I'm Otavio, and I work at Google Translate. Um, I'm going to start by just showing this video of something called WordLens that is now part of the Google Translate app. Um, this one does have some audio, not critical, but kind of nice. Testy. So yeah, I started one, the company that uh, made this one, app, and two. then about three and a half years ago, we joined okay. Google. Um, this is just a little nice. demo of how it works. So it does real-time translation, um, it does computer vision, it does OCR, it does translation, it does all of that on the phone. So, you know, if you're in a foreign country and you're roaming or something like that, you don't have to worry about networks. Um, so I don't know if we have to go through the whole song, but I think that gives you the general idea, right? Um, and generally what I wanted to do here today is use this as kind of a jumping off point into uh, different ideas in deep learning that I find to be fascinating. And so we're going to start with a demo of how uh, this app works. So for that, I'm going to change over. And the reason why I really wanted to do this on my laptop is because I've got a real-time demo here. Um, how's that looking? Good, OK. Um, so this is the actual debugging program that we use to debug that application. Um, and with this, we can visualize what's going on. So I, I brought this shirt today so that we can read things on my shirt. Um, and what we can do is we can you know, look at this from the perspective of the app. The app brings in an image from the camera, throws away the color. Sometimes that's not ideal because you know, the, the red on black text doesn't really pop very well. Um, from there, we run it through some filters. Um, this filter kind of takes the the lights makes it white, takes the darks, make it, makes it black. And then we can threshold it. And so now we've got a bunch of thresholded images that are one bit per pixel. From there, we can look for all the blobs of pixels. Um, I think this might be doing something weird with my mic. but And, and that, that's all the potential letters. At the same time, we've got a lot of weird stuff in there seeing stuff in my like teeth. It always picks up eyeballs. So there's a lot of false positives. If I point it out at you, I might as well do that, just to see if the, the, the video holds. Oh, look at all those letters out there. So many letters. I'm going to read all of you. Um, so from there is a, is a process of filtering things and, and trying to cut things down. So um, we look at what letters are next to each other within certain constraints. Um, and that puts together lines. And now you'll see it's kind of colorized by lines of text. And you can also see it's, it's, not, it's not detecting some fonts. We do uh, mostly Latin, Cyrillic, Chinese, Japanese, Korean. These fonts that are all connected together, they don't, they don't quite work. So there are limitations. I like pointing out limitations for some reason. Maybe I'm supposed to pretend it works perfectly. Um, low contrast line rejection. Now we've gotten rid of some of the things in the background. Uh, some some of the, the wallpaper, stuff like that. So it's, it's a process of cleaning these things up until we get to these like oriented boxes around each letter, basically. And from there, we have a question of what is the letter? And uh, so far, we haven't done any machine learning stuff. We've just done... You know, my uh, colleagues like to insult me and call it heuristics or engineering um, because it's just not machine learning -y enough. Um, so now let's dive into this concept, what is a letter? And for that, we're using convolutional neural networks. And that's, that's where I'm going to be able to start diving into neural networks, which I have made a nice little real-time demo for also. Let me make this big, refresh. OK. so. We've got a letter A. We all know this is a letter A. The computer doesn't know what it is. What we're going to do is we're going to run this through a convolutional neural network. Um, now, I should have maybe thrown a disclaimer out there. This is going to be kind of a beginner level talk. And I'm just going to start by going over how a convolutional neural network works. Um, you can see here there's a little, uh, there's a big pattern. That's the letter A. There's a little pattern that we just zoomed in on. That is a pattern that we scan across the bigger pattern. And we're basically looking for pattern matching. And this thing 
takes the input image, it takes its pattern that it's looking for. That pattern is a vertical line. You can see that it's kind of like dark pixels on the left, light pixels on the right. So it's looking for a, a dark to light transition. Anywhere it sees that, it's going to put out a green. That means positive. Red means negative. So it's, it's finding the positive correlations, the negative correlations. And now we do this with multiple patterns. So the next step here is uh, now you can see the pattern is kind of a horizontal fade, right? It fades from light to dark vertically. And all the, all the things that it's going to pick up, all the things that are going to be green and red, they're all going to be um, you know, horizontal edges, basically. So, so we're doing a very simple pattern match. This is the convolution part of the convolutional neural network. From there, we do this thing that they call a rectified linear activation unit. Now, this one has always gotten to me a little bit, because all it is is you cut off the negatives. You just clamp the negatives. And um, somehow it ended up with the name rectified linear activation unit, which just seems a little too complicated to me. Um, so now we've gotten rid of the negatives. So we have only the positive examples of these different patterns that we were looking for. Realistically, you're not going to look for two patterns. That's just for my visualization. Realistically, you're going to have like 100 patterns or so that you're looking for. Um, from there, we take that 16 by 16 image. We make it smaller. We basically make a summary of the image, summary of where these patterns are that we found. So now it's an 8 by 8, uh, a collection of 8 by 8 images that have the patterns that we were looking for. At this point, we kind of repeat the process. So now we go through with, now we're looking for patterns of patterns. Um, if you want to make like a, an analogy to like recognizing human faces, let's say, initially it'll say vertical edge, vertical edge, horizontal edge. It'll go down the line, and now patterns of patterns. So it's, it's looking for more complex patterns. It's making a hierarchy. So it's going to look for things that can be made from simple edges, corners, circles. It's going to find corner, circle, corner, circle, circle. Then it's going to go down the line again. It's going to find things made from those. Circle, circle, that's a nostril. Corner, circle, corner, that's an eyeball. Eyeball, go down the line. It's going to find things made from that. Find the whole face. This, this repeated process, uh, all these layers, this is the deep part of deep learning. Um, so here you can see, yeah, we, we, we make the thing smaller. This is a, a very simplified example. And so we're just going to cut and we're just going to say we have a couple layers. We don't have the 100 layer thing that people do these days. And we're going to go straight to the end. Now we've got this thing that represents patterns of patterns. And if it's deeper, patterns of patterns of patterns of patterns. And we're just going to kind of stamp it out against the pattern of pattern of pattern of pattern that represents the letter E, that represents the letter D, that represents ABC, and see which one it matches with best. And that is, um, you know, that's, that's generally. Um, uh, I, I won't get into the, the terminology too much, but that's basically going to give us the result, like which one wins, right? Um, so it's, it's basically a process of pattern matching, of hierarchical pattern matching. And that's what uh, makes convolutional neural networks work. These are, what I just showed you, are the fundamental building blocks of convolutional neural networks. The things that you see that get the best scores on all the convolutional neural network tasks they're just variants of this. They'll split the signal up. They'll run different sizes of patterns on it. They'll bring it back together. But it, these are the fundamental building blocks. I'd say the only fundamental building block I left out here was a normalization operation that will kind of keep the things in, in a good range. Um, the, the learning part of deep learning um, can also be explained with this, I think. Um, the learning part is all these patterns that we're scanning across like, uh, might as well go right back to here. That pattern that we're scanning across, that's learned. I kind of stretched the truth a little bit when I said this is a vertical edge. It's not a vertical edge. It's whatever the computer came up with. And the computer comes up with that by trying to you know, get the best score for those final letters, basically. Um, and that's the, the gradient descent or, or backprop, backprop process. Um, so OK, so that's the general idea with convolutional neural networks. And that is how uh, WordLens recognizes its letters. Um, OK, now I'm going to switch back. So a lot of you have probably seen this one already, but I'm going to go over it because I think it is kind of amazing. Um, this is the, so there's a, a data set called ImageNet. It's a bunch of pictures, great white sharks, tiger sharks, boats, planes, go-karts. 
a thousand different categories of pictures, and there's a competition every year for uh, who can make their computer recognize these pictures the best. Generally, okay, so in 2012, the convolutional neural networks hit, and they hit big from 25% to 16% error. And this is uh, called top five error. So you, you get five guesses, and if it's in there, you win. Like if you say, oh, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman, then you get it. It was Superman, right? Um, so, so this thing just kind of exploded in 2012 because of convolutional neural networks. Um, and now you can see it just keeps going down. Um, I'd say this last year, um, it was at about 3%. It was at 3.07 and 2.99 or something, I think. And people were saying, like, oh, this is done. You know, the, you can see the human there at 5%. That's one human decided to do this on his own, this guy Andre. And um, he happened to get 5% after, like, studying what, like, tiger sharks look like and great whites look like and stuff like that. Um, so people were like, oh, 3%. This data set is done. We've got to move on to another one. Then just, like, two months ago, this other paper comes out, and they're like, we got 2.25%. 2.25 2.25 from 3% is kind of a huge deal. And so it's really exciting that this is still moving and moving quickly. Um, this, I took that same neural network architecture um, that I just showed you, basically. And just for a sp spare time project with my friends, we took a radio control car and we made it autonomously drive. Um, this has nothing to do with the Google self-driving car. I don't want to. Waymo team to get mad at me for misrepresenting them or something. This is just me and some friends making our RC car drive around the track autonomously. Um, what's cool about this image, I think, or this video, is that it shows all the inputs and outputs from the neural network in this video. Let me just uh, go again. Um, basically, the input is this image at a 128 by 128 resolution, and the, the speedometer that we get from that odometer at the bottom. The output is steering and throttle motor controls. It learns by me driving around the track with the radio control. It learns to mimic my driving, and it manages to drive around the track. And I think that's pretty cool, like because it, it shows the, the versatility of this. I just took something that I was using at work for character recognition, and I'm like, hey, let's make the car drive around the track. And it drove around the track. It did hit a wall once, but it's not perfect. Um, OK, so from images, I want to go over to language, to words, things like that. So I'm going to start by just looking at, at this for a second and really quick explaining high dimensional spaces. OK, so if you've got, you, you've got a 4 by 8 image here, it's essentially kind of a distilled uh, version of a letter that we were looking at. Um, if you've got, let's say, just a 1 by 1 image, you can represent that somewhere on a number line. You've got a 2 by 1 image, which two pixels, you can represent that as a point in two-dimensional space. A three-pixel image is a point in three-dimensional space. So we can think of this as a point in 32-dimensional space. Um, and, and that's going to be useful for, for, uh, for some language stuff. But um, basically, all these things can be just thought of as points in high-dimensional space. Um, so for language, you can do this with words. And this is not supposed to be a still slide. This is supposed to be. Uh, what happened here? Sorry. Back here, back here. Refresh. All right, so I made a visualization of, uh, of these, these words in uh, three-dimensional space. It's kind of inadequate uh, because these should be in 100-dimensional space or 1,000-dimensional space. So the idea here is you can take a word, tree, and you can say how happy or sad that is. That's one dimension. How good or bad that is. That's another dimension how big or small that is. And for any word, you can do this. And you can do this by taking a data set, like let's say Wikipedia. You feed Wikipedia into a neural net, and it can just figure out you know, good places to put these words that represent all these different properties of the words. And then once you've got these words in this high dimensional space, you can do uh, very interesting things with them. You can do vector math on them. So I've got all these words floating around. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to type in two words, good, bad. OK, so now what the program did is it projected everything onto the good, bad number line. And now we can see in this particular data set, which I did not make. I downloaded this one, I think, from Stanford. Um, what are good words and what are bad words? Well, there's one word that's better than good. That's cooperation. Hooray for cooperation. Great. 
provide support important. Okay, so, so to get a little more specific about how this is made, it looks at neighboring words. You feed it Wikipedia, we look at neighboring words. We have the word birthday, we know that's a happy thing because people say happy birthday. You have the word birthday, you, we know it's something you can possess. People say your birthday, my birthday. And so it can get all these properties of the words and it can put it into this high dimensional space that is meaningful. Um, so now let's look at the bad side. Now the bad side is a little bit sad. Um, I think that in this data set, <laughs> Japanese banks were just having a hard time at that time. Okay, billion, banks, loss, problems, bank, due, <laughs> crisis. So, so basically, yeah, we can um, project this stuff onto different, different lines, and, and we can also do uh, math with this. So let me switch over to a classic example of what you can do with these things. Um, you can do an analogies. You can do math. You can say king minus the vector for man plus the vector for woman, and you'll get queen. You can, you can if you look at capital cities versus their countries, the, the vectors will generally go in the same direction. So there's a lot of, a lot of tricky like an analogy math that you can do once you've got your words into this space. Um, okay, so, so now I want to talk about something called zero-shot learning, which I think is really fun. Um, for this one, you have to remember that that convolution that I said represents an image as this 32-dimensional vector. Or maybe in the case of a for real convolution, that it'll be a much higher dimensions. But um, in, in the case of this example, a 32 dimensional vector. And, and then we've got this word space that's got, let's pretend that has a, a 32 dimensional vector also, right? We can do a, a mapping between the 32 dimensional vectors in the image over to the word space and say, you know, cat image maps to cat word, dog image maps to dog word, right? And, so then the tricky thing that you can do with this, this is called zero-shot learning, is you can hand it an image that the image side was never trained on. You can hand it, hand it an image of a deer. It'll project the thing through, and then you find the nearest word in the word space, and it'll be deer. Now this doesn't work, I wouldn't even say it works well, from my understanding. It works a little bit. But I love this because it's, in my opinion, it's analogous to how humans think. And so that's really exciting to me. If you have a little kid that's never seen an octopus before, you can say an octopus is a squirmy thing, bulbulous, it has eight legs, it swims around. Then you can go to the aquarium. That kid, having never seen an octopus, can point it out, say octopus. And that's what this is doing. This is it's basically representing the learning in multiple different ways. There's an image representation of the learning, there is a word representation of the learning. The reason why this works is because there's so much information encoded in the word representation of the learning that I, I'd, I can only um, speculate a little bit here, but um, I'd imagine that it knows things like a deer has four legs, a deer is an animal like a dog, like a cow, and so it, it knows a lot of the properties of these things, and so then when the, the image comes in and it's a four-legged thing that kind of looks like a dog, it's going to take you into the generally right area. So that's zero-shot learning, um, one example of zero-shot learning. Um, from there, now that I've explained some of these word things, I want to take it to uh, neural machine translation. So I work at Google Translate, and in the last year, Google Translate switched over to neural networks for its machine translation system, and we saw a lot of gains. Um, basically, we got halfway to human quality. So what we do is we ask people to represent, to, we ask people to rate translations zero to six, okay? If you give one of these raters a professionally done human translator, a human translation, they will generally say it's a five. It's a tough audience to please. Um, the old uh, Google Translate from like a year ago got generally about a 3.8. The new gets about 4.3. So it's gotten about halfway to human performance, which is kind of exciting, I think. Um, so I, I, I want to throw out there really quick that 
you know, that concept of the word vectors is something, the, the, you know, the words in high dimensional space, that is something that Google Translate uses as kind of like the first step when you go into this neural network machine translation. It takes things into this kind of high dimensional representation of the word. And the last step, it takes it from a high dimensional representation out to like, you know, a word, you know, in Unicode or something. Um, so from here, I just want to go over this um, multilingual Google neural machine translation to get eventually to another zero shot idea. Um, so, so Google Translate, it's, it's trained, you know, you give it language pairs, you give it, you know, something in Portuguese, something in English, and you just give it millions of these things, millions of these things, and it figures out how to do the translation, right? So in this case, the, the example is showing, we're training English to Korean, English to Japanese, and I think that's Korean, basically both Japanese and Korean back and forth to English. We never train Japanese to Korean or Korean to Japanese, but the neural network learns a kind of intermediate language, a, a, a language that can, you know, to it, optimally translate between these different things. And then from there, we can do zero-shot translation. So we can translate language pairs that it's never seen before, that it's never been trained on. We can go Japanese to Korean, Korean to Japanese, even though it has never specifically been trained on those pairs. It was only trained on English back and forth to those languages. OK, so that's uh, a bunch of translation stuff. And now I'm going to go somewhere completely different. Like I said, I'm going to throw in a lot of different concepts here. And uh, I hope you'll like it. So, Generative adversarial networks. People love these things right now. In the beginning of the year, there's like a new paper that people were talking about every week on generative adversarial networks. Um, so I'm going to try to explain how these generative adversarials, uh, GANs, I'll call them GANs, how these GANs work. Um, so with GANs, I like to think of it as an artist versus an art critic. Let's say you've got an artist that wants to make a photorealistic image. We've got an art critic that's like, sorry, you're not there yet. Sorry, you're not there yet. Um, so this is my uh, super advanced diagram of the neural network. Um, and right here, you'll see that there's a, there's a switch coming from either the generator or the photo. The generator is this artist that's trying to make something that looks photorealistic. The goal of this network, let's say, is to make a photorealistic looking image, to make a neural network that can generate photorealistic looking images. Um, the generator here is, is a neural network. It's starting from scratch. It doesn't really know how to paint something or, you know, generate something. Um, the photo is the reference. That's the real thing. The discriminator's job is to say, is this a real, is this a photo or is this something made by the generator? The generator's job is to fool the discriminator. Okay, so the discriminator basically has one job, real or fake, figure it out. And this is a, you know, this is a supervised task. We, we, we try it out, we give it the right answer, it learns from the right answer, right? Um, and then the generator is just like, fool the discriminator. So what we're gonna try here, we're gonna play the GAN game, okay? I would like, if you could, for the audience to be the discriminator, and I'll be the generator, okay? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put an image up, and then you're gonna have to say, is this a photo or is this a painting that I made on my Nintendo DS. Okay, so I painted a bunch of pictures. I'm gonna throw them up and I'm gonna see if I can fool you. Because as the generator, that's my job, fool you, right? Your job is just to make the right call, photo or painting. Are you ready for this? All right, cool. Photo or painting? I hear photo, that is correct. All right, let's go to the next one. Prepare yourself, photo or painting? I'll have to admit, this is not my best work. Um, but you are correct, it is a painting. Um, now, if somebody out there, maybe some artist in the audience can critique me and say, like, honestly, I don't see, the what's the difference? Be I just started out, I'm a generator just starting out. What's the difference between this and a photo, really? Can somebody call that out, maybe? No background, blocky. Okay, cool. So 
those are gradients coming to me. This is the neural network. This is the discriminator passing information to the generator. This is what makes this work. Even though we're fighting each other, we're learning from each other. OK? So no background. I promise you, the next thing that I paint, and I'm pretending to paint these in real time here, the next thing that I paint will have a background. OK, so let's continue on with the GAN game. Painting or photo? Photo, correct. Painting or photo? Correct again. Painting or photo? Painting, oh, you got it right. You are correct. This is a painting. Um, now, once again, it would be nice if you could send me some gradients so I could update my, um, my algorithm here. Can anybody critique me on this one? Too coarse. OK, so next time I paint a picture, I promise I'll make the brush size smaller. OK? All right, keep going. GAN game. Painting or photo? Photo. Yes, it sounds like you got that one. Painting or photo? Sounds painting. You are correct. Painting. Um, if anybody has a critique for me on this one, then I can update my algorithm. The, the face, the face. OK, OK. All right, so I have to do better on the faces. OK. Uh, one more here. Painting or photo? I heard one painting, mostly, mostly photo. All right, this one's a painting. Um, so I tried to make my brush size smaller. Um, you know, I tried to do everything you did, that, that, that you explained. And uh, you know, hopefully, I got um, close to photorealism, because honestly, this is the best I've got um, you know, <laughs> painting on my Nintendo. Um, but that's the idea here, is that you know, we're kind of fighting against each other, but also uh, the generator is using information from the discriminator to see how to update things. Um, the generator's task is not really make a beautiful picture, make a photo. The generator's task is just fool the discriminator, right? Um, the discriminator's task, the discriminator is really the one that understands what a photo is, if, if you could say there's any understanding here. Um, and so, yeah, I should have had this thing up, but like, just as far as, yeah, I guess this, this was the slide for what I just said, basically. Discriminator, just to refresh our memory what the network looks like, discriminator's learning real or fake, and then it can pass signals back to the generator, um, so the generator knows how to do better. Um, why GANs? So this is something that uh, I had trouble coming up with a way to explain in a quick amount of time, and uh, let me see how much time I do have. OK. Um, GANs are a way of learning an objective. So if you wanted to make a generative model, you could make your own objective function that's like, this is what a good image looks like. But that can be very difficult. So with GANs, instead of trying to make your own function of, this is what good looks like, you just learn that function using the discriminator. Um, hopefully that makes some sense. That's the, the best I could explain that one. Um, Examples of what an actual GAN makes and not the human GAN. Um, there's a lot of different variations of GANs. Honestly, there's a lot of different variations of everything that I've been talking about today. This is one particular variation that had nice pictures, so I figured I'd throw this one up. So these are all generated pictures. OK, so GANs are pretty cool. I like GANs. But um, one, one, one place that I wanted to go from here is taking these ideas that are in GANs and using them for something else. And here I want to take the generative adversarial network, leave off the generative part, and just. <laughs> um, leave off the generative part, just stick with uh, the adversarial network concept, and, and see if we can do domain adaptation. And domain adaptation here is you, you, you train a neural network in one situation, and you want it to apply to another situation. So what I'm going to be doing here is I mentioned earlier that I had this self-driving car that's a radio control car that's self-driving that me and my friends made. Well, we go to this warehouse in Oakland every month, and we race this stuff with friends, and that's what that picture is. I want to make a simulation of that warehouse, train this car in the simulation, and I want it to work in real life. The problem is, um, OK, yeah, so here's, here's my simulation of the warehouse. Um, this is me driving through the simulation. And, and, and basically, a, a quick summary of the neural network architecture is convolution net that I split into two things for this thing, just like the convolution net that I showed earlier. 
and it outputs steering, and, and that's my simplified model, okay? Okay, so, so now I want to do this thing where I've got kind of a real image and a fake image. Ideally, that thing on the left would also be a first-person view, but I didn't uh, get that one together in time. Um, but what's, what you can notice about this is that there are differences between the real and fake. As hard as I try to make a sweet video game that's photorealistic, you know I like photorealism, um, I'm going to miss things. Like right here, I'm obviously missing, there's people standing around the track. I'm missing that. There's, there's slight lighting differences. I'm missing that. So I, I want a neural net that can learn how to ignore those things, let's say. So I'm going to take a, a page from the, from the GAN book, and I'm going to hang a discriminator off the side of this convolutional neural network. The convolutional neural network, you know, it's doing its thing. It's making this hierarchical representation. It's got this high-dimensional vector that passes on to the second layer, so it can do a little more processing throughout the steering. Now, we're going to take somewhere in the middle, and we're going to put a discriminator on there, and we're going to say, OK, discriminator's job, once again, is this real or is this fake? That's, the, that's really the only job of the discriminator. And we've got tags. We can train it on what's real and what's fake. Um, once the discriminator can see what's real and what's fake, we flip it around. We flip that thing around. We send gradients back, and we say, unlearn the difference between real and fake. OK, so I said, you know, real has people standing on the side. Now the neural net can say, OK, I've, I've, the discriminator has recognized that there's people. And, and we can send that information back with a negative sign on it and say, erase those people from what you're paying attention to. So now the neural net will see, I'm not exactly sure what it'll see where the people were, maybe a blur, maybe, maybe more road, something like that. But it'll adjust itself so that it doesn't anymore pay attention to the people. And this is, this is GAN-like also, so it is, it is kind of a fight, once again, where the discriminator is trying to say, oh, I see something there. And then, and then we say, screw you, discriminator. We're erasing that. Um, and then, and then this, the thing that's trying to optimize for the steering is trying to use all the information it can get. And then the discriminator just keeps sending back and saying, erase that, erase that. You're not allowed to use that. You're not allowed to use that. Um, so yeah, this is, this is something, I, I think it goes by a lot of names, but generally we can call it you know, domain adaptation using adversarial nets. Um, and that's something I, I work on just for fun. So let's see how I'm doing here. OK. Um, so that's, that's basically the general idea. I wanted to, you know, in a concrete way, get down to, to what these things are doing. There's a lot of hype around this stuff. Some of it's well-deserved, like, in my opinion, the image net results. That's amazing. That's well-deserving of hype. But there's also a lot of people that don't really understand what's going on, and they're hyping it up in strange ways, in my opinion. And so I, I love just trying to demystify what's going on here, hopefully give you something that's concrete enough that you can say, yes, I understand how convolution nets work. I understand GANs. I understand these things that people are talking about. Um, and then also, like, I just wanted to throw things in here that are fun because, you know, deep learning, machine learning, it should be fun. I see a lot of people walking around acting like it's a job and they just get paid to do this. But, like, this stuff is fun stuff. It's conceptually fascinating, I think. And you can use it to do silly things like hook up a toy to be autonomous and race with your friends, all these things. So if anybody wants to ever, like, you know, work on some projects together or something, Hit me up. I love nerding out, about, nerding out about this stuff. You know, if it's work, if it's for fun, hit me up. Um, let me know. That's basically my presentation. Thanks.